Beijing normally a hustling, bustling city. If you look around, there's bugger all people. It's not because some sort of bomb went off, it's because it's Chinese New Year this week. Hence, no one's around. Now, what do you do on Chinese New Year? Me? I go to North Korea. Stay in Pyongyang, North Korea. This is uh, Kim Il somebody around the square because of those two guys. These new apartment blocks were built in 15 months so they could be opened to commemorate the 100th birthday of the first leader. And uh, the interesting thing is they light up at night and look really good. <coughs> look closely. How many apartment lights are on inside the building as opposed to decorative lights? outside. Let me uh, show you the lights of glistening Pyongyang at night time. ritual around this that you have to do, or gulag it is. Um, not allowed to take cameras in, so I can't show you any of that sort of hoo-ha. Um, but apparently we get to see cars and shoes and all sorts of stuff like that, but we'll see. One needs to suspend disbelief um, in going in there. I mean, someone said as we're going in, why is it that only communist countries have their leaders lie in state? My answer is, well, we throw ours out at elections when we decide we don't like them anymore, so there's no way we're going to put them in state. But, along with us going in and having a look, were normal North Koreans and soldiers, and they were weepy and teary, and you could hear people sniffing. The emotion that they hold for their leaders is, is genuine. And if you question that, I'd like you to think about this. If you only have one source of information, you believe that source of information. So you might believe a bizarre thing like this person was a great leader, like other people believe bizarre things, or people being nailed to the cross and rising again three days later. So the emotion that you see is genuine emotion, but it's emotion based on flawed information, I could say. Um, the other thing that strikes me is how bizarre it is to have a palace like this one and your whole country is you know, struggling for the basic day-to-day -day food necessity and things like that. And leaders can be at the same time self-delusional as their country is completely delusional about its place in the world. We're heading down into the uh, underground tube station in Pyongyang. It's apparently the um, deepest underground system in the world. It's designed also to be a nuclear bunker.
bit bad here in the government of Victoria. What do you think about this as a uh, renovation model for Flinders Street Station? I'm going to draw a little comparison for you here. Every train station has a theme. This one's Triumph, so all of the murals are in accordance with that theme. So I prefer to call it propaganda rather than art. Compare it to the train stations in Moscow. Real art, the statues, the beauty there. But this place, everything is propaganda. While we're on the subject of transport, this is of course a good public transport system. We threw the guy a little while ago when asking him, how much does it cost to buy a car? And he kind of looked at his dumb and saying, what do you mean cost to buy? And we're like, well, how do you get a car? He's like, oh, the state gives it to you as a reward. Uh, well, who we asked? Well, a famous sportsman or a famous actor or something like that. In other words, you can't buy a car here. It can only be given to you by the state or the organisation you work with, which is state-owned. Um, so this bullshit of we encourage people to walk? Well, yeah, the easiest way to encourage people to walk is don't let them have cars. This is the uh, Pyongyang Arc de Triomphe. It's modelled on the one in France, but bigger. That makes them very proud. It's right, there are so many monuments to the Kims here in Pyongyang that we're now taking to call these Kimmyments, not monuments because there are so many and we've been told you're not allowed to <clears throat> take partial photos of the statues, you've got to take them in full length. I suppose now is as good a time as any to remind you that Pyongyang, although even though all the architecture is new and the kimmyments are all new, uh, well new as in this century, uh, Pyongyang was first founded 5,000 years ago they say and as a city back in about 450. That's not 450 years ago, in the year 450. So it's actually quite an old and ancient city. Unfortunately, other than uh, one or two old remnants of the ancient gates and uh, small foundations of the old walls, not much exists of old Pyongyang, and um, I think that's uh, thanks to a whole bunch of B-52s, or equivalent, back in the 1950s. And here we have another Pyongyang traffic jam. One whole car. So let me just uh, log into the North Korean iTunes store and get my map of Pyongyang <laughs> and I'll avoid the traffic as I cross the road. Uh, here we are at another monument. This time it's not a monument. It is just a symbol to a discredited, uh, discredited political and economic system. I need to say so with a happy smile on my face in case someone gets offended or arrests me. Here we are at a, another Kimmyment. It's a big hundred and something or other metre tower to commemorate Kim Il Sung or Kim Il Jung or Kim Jong Il or whatever his ideas that no one's been able to explain to me. So let's go up and have a look. It should at least provide a good view. Do you have anywhere? Is it a bit like Baghdad? Why is it that all those sorts of countries have arches like this? Here we are, heading down towards Khao San on uh, down near the uh, demilitarized zone on North Korea's side. I'm tempted to say 
on one of its busiest highways. Now, you're going to hear me taking the piss a lot about the fact that there aren't any cars on the road. And there aren't any cars on the road. And looking at it from a western side, that says a lot about the fact that there aren't many cars. But how many times have you been into a developing country and gone into their capital city and gone, ah, oh, that's clean air. Morning. It's cool. It's North Korea. It's day three. I've just had my bucket bath because the uh, hot water pipe was broken and therefore the washing facilities didn't work. You know, it's well below zero here at night and you'd think paper thin walls were uh, romantic until they're the only thing keeping you between you and the natural environment very pretty traditional building this don't get me wrong and this is probably the sorts of things that was years ago uh, but it's cold there are two day-to-day -day things i find quite bizarre here <clears throat> the first one is people will not make eye contact with you even if you say hello they need to be young before they look up sort of like young i mean like six or five they, only then will they look up to you and wave back, but otherwise they will assiduously avoid eye contact. And the second one is the complete lack of road awareness. Uh, the bus has to beep to get people out of the way. And that's largely because why would you need road awareness when your average traffic jam looks like this? Here we are in Kaesong. This is the new Confucian University uh, built in nine 92. Let's leave the blah blah about the Kims for a second. Europeans are so European centric about their own history they forget about Asia. This was a metal type block 300 years before the Gothenburg Bible. Gutenberg. Gutenberg. Thank you. Gutenberg. There you go. It takes a European to tell me off. Is it Gutenberg, is it? Gothenburg is a city in Sweden. Gutenberg was the name of the guy that. I think it was yeah. in, Ch in Cheers, though. Ted Gutenberg. <laughs> oh, really? Steve Gutenberg. So yeah. No, I don't know. Anyway, that's an older version than the European metal printing press. That's the point. Here we are, DMZ from the north side. A couple of years ago, I was standing on that balcony there. Now we get it from both sides. Still a complete waste. visiting Boichon Buddhist temple built in 1042 and some of the carvings date back to 1666.
I'm here with Sean. We're part of the tour to North Korea. We have just spent the most bizarre morning wandering around a purpose-built and a marble-filled, uh, chandelier-enriched building housed to display the gifts that different people have given the Kims over time. Heads of state, visiting delegations. The Australian Socialist Party, which I assume must exist, gave a beautiful vase. And of all things in Korea, this has pissed me off more than anything else. Only because of the deception of it. Because the people are told here that these gifts are all given by all these people all around the world because of the immense respect they have for, for our leadership. And it's all crap. Um, and we all know that you know, gifts are given diplomatically and you read into them like Madeleine Albright when she came gave this very simple bowl, you know, diplomatically I've got to give a gift so let's give the simplest bloody thing I, I can. Um, but it's all part of the overall propaganda machine of the leadership to persuade their people, and their people believe it, persuade their people that their leaders are well respected all around the world and they live in one of the finest countries in the world. What do you reckon, Sean? I agree 100%. Absolutely. <laughs> there you go. We've just found out North Korea has now let off its nuclear test. Everyone will be panicking. <laughs> well, don't tell anyone, but we gave the guides a slip. So we're not allowed to go into shops and buy things. I did. I completed the entire transaction in North Korea on my own. <laughs> Day five, and another commitment, and we're in the study house to look at the way education is spread in the open and highly intellectual country of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Yes, the guide is listening. Like a lot of public buildings here, it's quite monumental. A lot of a lot of marble, a lot of glass and very, very cold inside because there's no heating. Here we are in a study house. We're told that there's access to the internet here where I've just had a bit of a look on the Explorers. Of course, it says in the but it's not. It's actually connected to a local area, like a false internet, to convince people that they have actually been connected to the internet, but they're not. Overlooking the uh, main square, it's Kim Il Jung Square. Kim Il Sung Square. Kim Il Sung Square, which is where all the military parades and stuff happen down there. Kim Il Sung Square, and it'd be really cool because we were we were down there yesterday. And you see all the dots on the ground where the people are told they need to stand when they wave their flags and do all that sort of stuff. Say hello to my brother. This is this is Honey. This is one of the guys. Say hi. <laughs> <laughs> now in the railway museum here, and it's amusing to me to find out whether they mention the words railway or train more or less often than the words president or Kim Il Sung. So far, the president's leading three to one. We're now going into the uh, Museum of Three Revolutions. I was thinking three revolutions chronologically, but no, it's ideology technology and uh, agriculture and I've got a feeling it's going to be heavy on ideology so I'm going to count how many times we hear the words heavy industry and how many times the, we hear the words Kim or president or great leader. Oops and there we have another Kim Oriel. So here we are in the Museum of Heavy Industry with another Kim Oriel behind us. Uh, like many things here you could come here and say why are there pictures and examples of the leader everywhere and why isn't this concentrating on heavy industry or concentrating on mining or the other things that these museums are supposed to do 
because everywhere you go there are old or new pictures of the leader. The point of coming here is not to learn about heavy industry or to learn about mining or to learn about shipbuilding. The point of coming here is to see how that cult of personality permeates everything. So this is not a museum about heavy industry. This is a museum about the leader and heavy industry. This is not a museum, uh, or otherwise the train museum was not a museum about trains. It was a museum about the leader and trains. So this is about how the cult of personality permeates every aspect of life and community. Now to the cemetery of the martyrs for World War II against the Japanese. Now normally I take some of these kimorials with a pinch of salt. But this time I have bought the flowers and I will lay them. Now why? Because as I just pointed out to our guides and he was kind of surprised when I did this, World War II against the Japanese, North Korea and Australia were on the same side and he'd forgotten that. We often forget that. This cemetery is for those who the Japanese killed and this is one in which Australians, Americans and North Koreans are comrades in arms. As we uh, drive around in the bus, let me talk about something positive about Pyongyang. Uh, I used to have a little thing I called the 12 year old girl test, which is you judge the safety of a city by how many 12 year old girls you see wandering around on their own. If there are lots, it's a safe city. If there are none, it might not be. But the only city that still passes that test is Geneva in Switzerland. Whereas here, you see lots of kids on the street on their own without adult supervision nearby, and I interpret that as a city that is safe for kids. And I have to say, the odd time that we've been able to walk on the street, you don't feel safe, you don't have to guard your personal possessions. So individual personal safety is without doubt better than it is in a city like Rome or even London. So that's the positive aspect of Yongyang. Here we are in Pyongyang train station, about to leave. When I was in South Korea a couple of years ago, I got the photo on the DMZ at the train station and the South Korean side saying to Pyongyang and it's taken a couple of years and a different train, but I've got here. I'd like to say this, there's a few things I would like to have put on this video. Uh, some of the things the guide said, some of the things that we thought and did, but because this is going on the internet, for the sake of, well to be frank, the safety and security of the guides, I won't put those things on. They're the things that you're going to have to ask me individually when you see me. On reflection, and here is a summary. There are some things about the Democratic People's Republic of Congo, oh, Democratic People's Republic of Congo, there you go, Democratic People's Republic of Korea that are deeply upsetting. The good things are, people are people. At the end of the day, each of the Koreans we met here, and we met very few because we were very strongly controlled, they were young people looking forward to getting married one day, having children one day, and hoping that their children's future was better than theirs. That's the same hope that people have all around the world, regarding, regardless of what culture they are. But they are completely repressed by their government. The propaganda is all pervasive, and you can see in their faces sometimes that there's real pain, either from what we say that they disagree with or what we say that they know is true but that they can't believe or say themselves. The strongest points of this trip were probably when we were told you don't buy cars, they're given to you because you can't buy your own car on the street. Um, and the real fear in the eyes at times in our guides if we stray too far from what we were allowed to do. At the end of the day, my summary would be this. The people of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea are people like anyone else in the world. The government of the People's uh, Republic, very repressive, create fear, we all know that, but also incredibly clever when it comes to how the cult of personality and the propaganda has permeated every aspect of society. The belief that these people have that their leaders are looking after them and came from poor and humble backgrounds.
backgrounds and, and don't live uh, expensively flies in the face of all evidence to the reverse. But people don't see that, can't see that, aren't taught to see that. Now, we saw the former Eastern Bloc countries break up when the wall fell down and economic growth and freedom come to those countries. What is the thing that will break? What is the thing that will cause the Democratic People's Republic of Korea to collapse as a repressive regime? Some say China, some put hope in China. But then again, in my view, China is doing to the United States what the United States did to the Soviet Union. That is, every time it looks like they're going to cut some of their defense spending, a sabre is rattled and expenditure goes up. For China, the more the Democratic People's Republic of Korea creates fear in the minds of US policymakers, the more US policymakers spend on defense and the closer they are to bankruptcy. That's what China wants. So will China in any way really push this regime over? No. I cannot see the break in the cycle that will cause the freedom for these people. I hope they get it, but I don't see the roadmap.